Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Leila Bandar, and I am the Visual Arts Program Manager at Vermont Studio Center. If you're not familiar with the Vermont Studio Center, a bit about us. Again, welcome everyone coming in. I might add people in as they come. We're located in Northern Vermont in the town of Johnson, and we're a year round residency program. Our beautiful campus is bisected by the Guion River, and this time of year, the river is frozen and we have spots of the river flowing through the ice. Vermont Studio Center recognizes that it operates on the land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous people for thousands of years and is the home of the Abenaki people. We honor, recognize and respect these peoples as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we gather. Thank you for joining us tonight. And our special uh, artist is Jean Shen. And I'll give you a little bit about Jean Chin's background. She's recognized for her monumental installations. Uh, she has transformed large everyday uh, accumulations of everyday objects into expressions of identity and community engagement. Shin's innovative work has been widely exhibited in over 150 major museums and cultural institutions, including solo exhibits at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Smithsonian in Washington, DC, Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, among others. In recognition of her excellence, she has received numerous awards, including two New York Foundation um, Arts Fellowships in Architecture and Environmental Structures in 2008 and Sculpture in 2003. The Korea Arts Foundation of America, the Paul Krasner Foundation Grant, Asian Cultural Council, and Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Biennial Art Award. Her works and interviews have been featured in many publications, including the New York Times, Art in America, Sculpture Magazine, Art News, Freeze Art, Hyper Allergetic, and Brooklyn Rail. This year, Jean Shin had a solo project at Olana State Historical Site in Hudson, New York. And born in South Seoul, South Korea, and raised in the United States, Shin attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 1999 and received a BFA and MF Master's from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. She also received an honorary doctorate from New York Academy of Art. Shin is a tenured professor um, of fine arts at Pratt Institute and a recipient of Pratt's 2017 Alumni Achievement Award. Shin is president of uh, Joan Mitchell Foundation and serves on the board of Young Arts, the foundation, National Foundation uh, for the Advancement of Arts. And she lives and works in Brooklyn, New York and the Hudson. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, Jean Shen, for being here with us. Thank you for the lovely uh, introduction. Um, it's a pleasure being here. And uh, I say here <laughs> with you, because um, of course uh, we're doing this digitally, but I'm very familiar with Vermont through my life. And as I attended the Vermont Studio Center um, as a student uh, in my undergrad and when I was a painter. So I go back and thinking about the Vermont as a landscape um, to be captured. And you'll see how the conversation around um, being outdoors in plein air, then experiencing and wanting to recreate then uh, the kind of experience and then looking deeply at the ecological issues um, that is happening underfoot um, leading to climate crisis. These are all kind of concerns um, and uh, that you'll see in my work, but it, it does um, map my time at Vermont and it's been wonderful to come back over the decades as a visiting artist and a critic as well. Uh, so thank you. And I wish I was there in person. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. There we go. Um, and I wanna begin with early installations. So um, moving from painting, uh, probably painting the landscape and pa painting the figure, um, I really wanted to capture the body, but in an abstract and new way. And for me, moving to installation and moving to towards sculpture allowed me a certain kind of freedom of the imagination and not limited necessarily to the canvas, um, but it also infused meaning uh, more directly from 
the lived experience and also from the detritus of our life. Um, these are all pant cuffs. Um, so again, if I was standing in front of you giving this lecture, you'd say, wow, well, she's pretty, pretty petite, you know, sure. Um, and so um, whenever I am dealing with my own clothes, there's always a, a, a this height um, a deficiency, as they call it, not meeting fashion standards. And I really wanted to turn that language backwards to say, um, what does it mean to um, have this exactitude, right, in our relationship to fashion? And maybe that fashion doesn't suit our perfect bodies, you know, and then I wanted to celebrate the customization that we have in our life. So these are all pant cuffs that people would alter and throw out, or, but um, I intercepted the alteration uh, process and worked with the men to give me these scraps. Um, so instead of it going to the landfill, um, I collected them, I waxed them into these stiff forms that create this new landscape um, of the body in absence, the body uh, as a void. And so you can see some pant cuffs are altered a foot, <laughs> others just two millimeters, that exactitude of each person's relationship to this um, world of fashion. Um, so then I started to think about other accessories that are also not necessarily considered or seen um, from this installation. I have these beautiful pictures of um, students uh, making drawings of my installation, which I think is so inspiring because I'm inspired by the everyday. And here, um, for me, it was what we see and what we don't see. Um, so we might see a person and we might see their fancy shoes, but we really don't know what kind of life that they led. And it really is about the journey, the walk, every step tells a story. Um, but in fact, every step literally makes a mark on the leather of our souls. And so you have some shoes that we barely want and discarded, and others worn down uh, past the soles, creating a hole into the shoes itself. Um, so I love these ideas that these clothings and these accessories will really speak to the individual behind them and an aspect to their life that we may not have seen or been witness to. Um, when I was making that installation, I was really interested in those souls, um, but I kept removing the bodies and I kept saying the soul, the leather bodies. And so I had a pile of leather shoes uh, left behind. And then I thought, well, I'm calling them the bodies, but in fact, they are the bodies, not our own, but of a half. Um, so I wanted to take these leftover sharp, um, scraps from my own artistic production and reimagine going back to its material um, qualities, back to its wholeness, back to its own body um, before we discovered it and processed it into fashion. So I made these forms, the shoes were coupled together and they come together re-sewn into its own hide, like a pelt that's hanging, um, really questioning that we're taking one um, an animal of another skin and then refashioning it to cover our fate um, very much like tradition of moccasins um, but the fashion remains uh, so it's a hybrid object both longing for its origins and becoming something new and that strategy has been with me for a lot of objects um, in our life. Um, this is a collection of broken umbrellas that I rescued from the streets of New York. Um, after a storm, everyone goes to shelter and they often abandon the umbrellas because it's wet and one spoke is just poking out. And I um, was sad to find so many of these discarded umbrellas as if these were injured um, birds or something that, that seemed so organic and um, uh, needed to be back on its flight. So I rescued them, created new holes, remended the seams and introduced them back into the landscape. Um, here, not of just storms, but of this beautiful light, this canopy to hold wind um, and to be a matrix in which sun can, and light light and shadow can filter through. I've also created a little bit of that chaos um, when we lose this object um, that was just designed uh, for its own, own obsolescence and unfortunately to be so disposable. In fact, there's so much material waste here. And I wanted to show that chaos, um, uh, that kind of um, destruction of the, this lost object.
Um, I had the fortune to show my work early on at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, I was already creating these large scale installations in alternative spaces and nonprofits in New York. Um, that was at Socrates Sculpture Park, the Penumbra. Um, so here uh, with this invitation, um, I thought of um, an ambitious project and also shifting my practice a little bit from the found object um, to uh, collecting these objects with the partnership of the museum and particularly the curator. Um, so I asked the curator to collect her uh, work clothes and then to invite her colleagues um, to also donate the clothes. So it was a strategy in which I would no longer have to be mining the street and walking around, but really having a point person who would do that work for me and enjoy the conversations um, with her colleagues and trying to um, procure this material. Um, it also speaks to the identity of the institution. Um, museums are full of hierarchy, a uh, huge number of people being employed, people that we often don't see behind offices, but sometimes there are visible people in the guest services, the guards that are front facing. So I wanted to talk about an organizational structure of the hierarchies that live within and to reimagine uh, bringing everyone together, which would be an impossibility in one space uh, and one time, um, but also to reimagine both the fragmentation of this body, uh, but the wholeness nonetheless. Um, so these strategies of gaining um, access um, to the people that I might not actually know, um, but through this invitation, bringing um, people through their um, used clothing. Um, and then here in a um, more public facing project and one that is permanent, the general um, services, the federal government asked me to do a project. So I took the signature project that I did at uh, Museum of Modern Art and to try to imagine who is a community that is seen but uh, also unseen here. Um, so it's often the users of this um, uh, federal building um, and that was the veteran services. Um, and then also um, citizens who, you know, immigrants who want to become citizens. So going through the naturalization process. So I imagined um, bringing together two groups um, and weaving them together as a story about being American. Um, because Americans, of course, are, are uh, the story of immigrants. And yet, uh, once you become an American and you serve, that means you put on a different uniform and then travel the world. So it is kind of this interesting journey of intersections um, that happens at this building. Um, and what's so wonderful is to work with these um, uh, institutions, these government agencies, and to have access to people that I would not normally um, be able to be in touch with. So of course, my story as an immigrant overlaps very closely, in fact, into the same building because my uh, family also got their citizenship in Baltimore. Um, so we would have passed through this journey decades before. And so it was wonderful to share the story that the government has asked me uh, to do a public work that would be permanent. And I wanted to, it to be about the current immigrants who are coming through this building literally that day. Uh, so I invited the public um, who are now new citizens to donate an article of clothing. And here's someone who literally gave me their shirt off their back before they left the ceremony or afterwards. And then others who wanted to celebrate with me taking photographs of this momentous day um, and then would mail me their clothes after. And similarly in the mail, the veterans would come and photographs would come with um, from the, their uniforms, uh, really sharing a memory of how they served in this body a very, very long time ago. Um, I've also done other projects um, where the prompt of an invitation for a museum show will then be the, the German germation of the idea. So at the Asia Society, um, they were going to put together a contemporary um, Asian American uh, exhibition that would travel around the country. And, um, you know, the question was, are we doing identity based works? If not, what are the contemporary artists uh, of Asian descent and diaspora doing? And I said, well, why don't I let this be a prompt? I've been mapping societies and people um, for it to be about our, our people, our community. Um, and, and I was curious uh, to uh, ask for a sweater from the curators and then ask the curators to invite people that they were considering and who are in their network. 
weeks. So this is way before Facebook and Instagram. We didn't know who knew who, you know, it was sort of like a dark secret. Um, but we did know people in a physical sense of the word of relationships, you know. Um, so they were tight and they were um, and sometimes far in between. Um, and the phenomena of like how many degrees of separation we are from each other, it was really about how close we are to that knit community and how also fragile it is. Um, but then you also can imagine how expansive that network can be and who the key players are, what we call the gatekeepers, how close we are to them. And so I unravel these threads, have this Excel sheet of all the people they knew and how they knew them, and then reconnect this network at every institution that it traveled to. And every host city it would go to, uh, new communities of Asian Americans were asked to be tapped in and invited to this large installation and then continue to be reconnected. Um, I've had a long relationship with fashion, so I've been inspired by the everyday, moving toward mapping the body, uh, the, the, the people, and then had other collaborations where even the fashion designers are asking me to do a commission, of course, then looking at the patterning and this beautiful idea of the body in motion through origami, uh, taking the idea of the runway and then repositioning that into this empty space of the lobby of a museum. So it always comes back. <laughs> you know, what you're inspired by then comes to be uh, the thing uh, that it regenerates itself. Um, and so pattern making is exactly that. Um, I also wanted to share with you another thread, which is finding objects um, on the street um, that really speak to uh, our society and our society priorities and values. Um, and this is a a city made out of lotto tickets. Um, these are all losing tickets that one would scratch and, and win sometimes, but most often lose. And so there would be abundant, of course, where we say the game is rigged against um, having too many winners, right? So um, I use the same strategy to imagine like, what are the odds of creating a house of cards? Um, not by uh, cheating and putting glue on it, but really um, trusting that uh, strategy of just placing this card in space um, by gravity, uh, it's friction. But also for me, I was thinking about the will, the wish, the fantasy of someone, uh, the belief that you could win against the odds. And so we built the city um, out of chance. Um, chance is always embedded in it. The risk of the city falling any moment is true. But in fact, the opposite logic as we know happens. Um, it's nothing in life is instant. Uh, it's a very rare chance that you win instantly, but mostly it's the hard work of the day to day. Um, it's what you invest and the city takes time. Uh, it's slow, patient um, time that really actually makes these uh, visions and your dreams come true. Uh, and that is also true for the artistic uh, journey. That is also true for much of the American dream, um, that it holds this idea of instant success. But in fact, the realities are that trial and error, going back and being patient or resilience um, makes the city happen. Um, I also want to mention that I do a lot of site specific projects. Um, and so I do a lot of research and with this invitation is to kind of imagine what is the historic um, ways in which this uh, a place has been understood and the potential of a place. And so when the Smithsonian American Art had asked me to do a show, it was both um, a familiar place because I lived and grew up in Maryland right outside the city. Um, but I was also imagining a tourist coming in or in the world what this means. And of course it is their capital and uh, full of monuments. And the Smithsonian was part of these uh, institutions for the public. And I thought of the site, which is the National Mall that seemed so kin to my practice because it was left empty. It was full of potential unrealized and that we could fill it um, and that we could fill it with days that are of protests and other days that are full of joy and celebration like the inauguration of Obama and this was at the time when the show was happening um, so as well inspired by these ideas of the everyday man who has a vote to change and make history as opposed to the historical fathers that the monuments um, were typically um, uh, uh, commemorating so here 
year, I collected trophies and uh, refashioned them, removing their arms and limbs and remaking their gestures. So they're no longer about sports, um, but we collected over 2,000 trophies and imagine what we really need to celebrate is work, what people really do in life, which is to show up and do good work. And that may be the most modest thing that one does. So I recreated the uh, shape of the National Mall and filled it with the people of their trophies. And mostly these trophies are uh, received when they're uh, a young child full of optimism, you know, and they didn't become sports stars, but actually they did something even better, which was uh, become who they are in life, doing the work every day. And so it is this kind of reimagining of the people uh, all gathered and for them to be celebrated the everyday hero. So here's the sports player, the basketball um, player who no longer has, a, has, a, has the ball of the loop, but he's really carrying um, a tire. So represent a mechanic or the karate master who's really a chef. Um, and today we call them the essential workers, right? And we're so proud of them. We used to, you know, every evening um, rattle our pans, telling them they matter because we got our food, um, that we're so alive and we celebrate them. So this was kind of the reimagining I did in 2009 when it was on view. Uh, still very, very relevant, still needs to be celebrated every day and thanked um, our gratitude for the work people do. Um, and then I wanted to show site specific projects uh, that you could still see it's permanent here in New York. This invitation was through MTA. They had invited me to do a project in Flushing, Queens, and it is an incredibly dynamic place. Um, and in fact, full of Koreans. And so it made me think, oh, I really have to do something that is uh, really speaks into my cultural heritage. So um, when I thought back to the richness um, of our Korean arts, it lands in the most celebrated form, um, which is the Korean Celadon. So I travel all over the world and museums always say, oh, you're Korean. And when they discovered this, they immediately want to show me the Korean art effect <laughs> as if it represents all of Korea in these very little vases. But it is true that it has been so well celebrated that the tradition still goes on. There are artisans, um, potters who still continue to, to follow this uh, journey, this desire to get the perfect Celadon. Um, so in this process, Project, I went back to Korea to meet the ceramic artists and then to ask for their waste. Um, the, the desire for it's this perfect product uh, means if there is a crack, a hair, a little difference, they have to destroy their production. It cannot leave the atelier. Only perfect vases leave. Uh, and that is why it was so prized. And so I just thought, oh my God, seriously, what a waste, right? Because there was so much labor and love and so it doesn't pour or it leaks, but it's still so beautiful. And so this discarded landscape is one I wanted to celebrate and bring back. Um, so in, in those details, I could remake the Korean vase in a monumental space. I could also share this beauty of Korean Celadon in the most intimate way. So these are UNT students studying ceramics, but oftentimes they don't get to handle Korean ceramics, uh, traditional ones, even the broken ones. Um, so we remade um, this uh, kind of landscape, this uh, Zen garden, where a beautiful monolithic um, Korean Celadon vase would be made. But if you look closely, of course, it is only the broken shards, things that have been rejected. And I really think and question the notion of perfection. I want to celebrate imperfection. I want to celebrate our flaws and say that's the most perfect being human. Um, and also um, thinking in terms of diaspora, our conversation, that it's not about where you're coming from and whether you still live there. You're, you're still part of that rich history um, and really questioning our traditions traditional values when it comes to identity. Uh, I've worked a lot with vessels, and it seems like vessels are great containers to house histories. Um, 
and to also map our entire bodies um, and our behaviors and also shape our bodies and our behaviors. So this um, predates that even the Psyllidon project, these were prescription pill bottles. So um, once I left uh, the fabric world, I was thinking in terms of what are the other ways that we change or our body can be mapped almost chemically. Um, so these are prescription pill bottles where um, you know, from nursing homes or everyone else from the medicine cabinets would give me, um, and I would create these large structures Structures, thinking about our dependency and uh, our desire for quick cures, right? The instant medication. But in fact, it is a long journey to healing and how even with a vaccine, it is a long journey to self-care and caring for each other. Um, so even medication isn't really the answer. It is just part of some of the solutions that we have. Um, and then other vessels, this is not toward health, um, but really the opposite. Um, it's disguised in this green beautiful bottle and these are Mountain Dew bottles and I love how they call them Mountain Dew as if it's fresh and natural and just the dew off a river um, but in fact um, it is just doing the opposite which is um, creating toxicities and it's processed food so it's a high fructose corn syrup and I thought oh it is actually a byproduct of corn it's a byproduct of our agriculture in middle America so we had school children all over uh, Iowa and Davenport around the museum create my installations through the educators um, who did arts education for the public school system through the museum. And they created a maze um, together with, in collaboration with the museum. So we collected um, you know, thousands of uh, Mountain Dew recycled bottles and then transformed them locally um, through the labor of the community. And it really maps both their landscape and the bodies um, being transformed by this product that promised to be so natural and refreshing and yet is causing uh, all sorts of health um, problems in the community as well as being exported everywhere in the world and thus uh, affecting us. And then of course, um, we can't even get into plastic pollution, which is forever with us and now into the landscape. So maze, um, I was creating this labyrinth because I wanted, how are we going to get out of this mess? <laughs> how do we find the exit that saves us? Um, but in fact, we find a lot of dead ends to these solutions around ecological, environmental, uh, and plastic pollution. And then I represented this project in New York, um, which seemed like an anomaly, like why corn? And of course, Manhattan, it's an indigenous uh, place where maize would have been growing in its natural form, but it's been just completely uh, gone and disappeared into a food desert. There's a, a winter garden space where any fantasy can be fulfilled, including uh, growing with uh, palm trees in the lobby and uh, products from all over the world. And so I just thought this corn maze would be like a mirage that one thinks you see something and yet you're not quite sure what you're looking at. Um, and then the byproducts of that whole installation when we're making those beautiful leaves and the two liter bottles were these bottoms. And I thought, oh, I have to save that. Even my own artistic production, there's no waste there. And of course we know plastic does uh, biodegrade so slowly, but forever with us in our landscape. And so it felt like this invasive environment um, that plastic is everywhere. And of course, plastics in our ocean is literally everywhere and taking over. Um, so this feeling that it could feel like something natural, but it is actually the incredible op opposite, uh, to the toxicity both in biodiversity um, loss, but also in our um, health system and uh, what's happening with our environment. Um, I've been um, wanted to show you some projects where I'm dealing with the form of nature uh, much more directly. Uh, here it is the form of a tree, um, but again, a, a hybrid object where I'm using um, a domestic object to talk about this. Um, very important subject. So trees are, this tree trunk uh, that's severed, a stump, is made out of old um, forks and knives um, and welded together to create this image of a tree. Um, and I really wanted to talk about that domestic space of cultivating this beautiful landscape, um, but also how uh, we shape nature and nature, of course, shapes us um, from every degree. There's also other conversations about um, 
the landscape in a, an extractive way our industries have come. This is in Arizona um, when I uh, was thinking about those beautiful mountains and looking at the distance. Not only did I realize that it was just beautiful, but it was also uh, our precious minerals. So how we're extracting uh, copper. And uh, I wanted to represent uh, this beautiful landscape through the material of keys. Keys, of course, is made out of brass and has components of copper in it. Uh, so I remapped the mountains um, around Phoenix and uh, Scottsdale in uh, lost keys that have been used and uh, discarded, meaning they no longer have access to a space. Um, so it's all about how redevelopment or desire um, for progress um, has really taken away from the landscape. Um, and it is really um, this kind of um, loss. Um, uh, and the project is called Lost Vista. Um, then I encroach further into the landscape, doing more outdoor projects of recent. Um, with this invitation at Storm King, I had a chance to not only be inspired by nature, but also come at a time where nature was incredibly vulnerable. So they had these planted uh, maple trees along their major uh, pathway. Um, it was the LA, a kind of a French tradition of planting trees one after the other. Um, they were dying. And so the one on the left is doing okay, the one on the right is not, and the rest of them right after were doing horribly. So they went through re revitalization, reimagining the landscape and decided that they would remove the trees and replace them with something that would be more sustainable. And at that point, it was too late for me to save these maple trees, but I, I realized that this would be the materials um, that I could use. And I wanted to slow down that process of removal uh, to really honor these trees that had given literally their life um, to beautifying uh, the landscape of Storm King and for it to be art. Um, so we milled the trees on site, uh, revealing the inside of the tree. And I wanted people to look at the tree almost in a dissection, uh, almost to see what we could not see. Um, um, not in its living uh, condition and health, but also in depth. And I made uh, and imagined a tree falling one after the other, like a domino effect. So it's a 50 foot length um, sculpture that in fact is also functional. So it becomes a uh, live edge uh, picnic uh, uh, picnic table. Uh, it's a communal piece in which people are invited to gather. Um, and because Storm King is so beautiful and there's so many acres of exploration, people tend to rush through trying to see one art object to another, like a destination. And what I wanted people to do was slow down, give them a space to sit, uh, to look at nature carefully, uh, that not it's no longer in the background, but really in the foreground. And we could see the scars of nature where old growth meets new, um, but also in the gathering that the art kind of disappears, becomes uh, part of the community. I also imagine what would it feel like uh, to taste uh, the landscape. And since maple uh, syrup um, comes from these trees, we harvested just enough sap to make a year's production uh, of the healthy trees, of the ailing trees, and also the um, dead ones. So it was kind of the, looking at the differences uh, that maple trees produce in their sap and really taste the sweet gift of these trees. Um, from one project to another, I, I now have become uh, an artist that's called upon when uh, an art site loses trees. And that happens, unfortunately, way too often. So just further north at Olona State Park, um, which is a New York State public park, uh, this hemlock tree was dying. And so they asked me to envision a project. And in my research, I discovered that the hemlock trees were really critical in the 1800s because the tanning industry used them to make leather. And then it just sent me right back to my work, uh, imagining those shoe bodies and the, where did leather production come from? So I, who knew that they were so linked to the hemlock trees. Um, and in fact, they were so valuable that they deforested the, uh, most of the cat skills, um, removing the bark and leaving them just bare. Um, and I just thought, oh my God, how horrific. Uh, they just took the bark, the trees died, 
and they didn't uh, use the trees um, even. Um, so it just felt um, that I wanted to understand this uh, trauma that the tree had witnessed. Uh, it turns out that Frederick Church also witnessed this, um, who is a famous landscape um, uh, painter. And when he made Olana and envisioned this public work, um, he too thought what a tragedy it was and planted these hemlocks, this tree in particular. So when we cut it down and it was dead, we could then read the um, annual rings and discover that it was planted exactly during the time of Olana. So this tree was a byproduct of you know, the deforestation and an artist's willingness to plant native trees and in hopes that the next generation could enjoy the hemlocks. And so we did. Um, but hemlocks are also now uh, fighting a new invasive species that is uh, causing um, them to die. And so I really wanted to talk about the, the kind of trauma and violence that uh, has been inflicted on these beautiful trees. So I removed and had a small modest reenactment of that using the same old tools of the 1800s. It's very easy to strip a tree, sadly, uh, and then the tree dies. Um, then I wanted to recreate um, a second shroud, a second skin um, for this tree. And so it was like a, um, a funeral, preparing the body, um, making it as ornate and beautiful, um, and also a reckoning of these two species, um, what we've done to them, what we continue to do um, because of our desire for these beautiful um, items. So our consumer goods, our consumer habits um, continue to create loss in our environment um, that is often unrecoverable. And um, so I used an upholstery tank because I it realized that the, the hemlock tree would never have been used for furniture because it had too many knots and it was just sort of seen as invaluable. And I wanted to create that value in the tree. It also almost acted like an armor. Um, another thread in my work, um, when you look at the waste stream, what we use, what we um, upgrade and throw away, uh, it's technology. And of course, it's been so prevalent um, more and more as we live through the pandemic. And I'm using even Zoom <laughs> to speak with you today. So here as an early project I did called Textiles that I did with the Fabric Workshop Museum. It was a time where we were just emailing. And I just thought that was an incredible phenomena of using these uh, touch sensitive keyboards, uh, but using the old QWERTY keyboard um, technology, how our uh, fingers move toward old technology technology like a typewriter, in fact, when it's not even needed. Um, so I created a new uh, textile that maps our email. So literally every word that we typed um, into this digital space then had to be outputted by an actual keycap. So we worked with an e-recycler at that time um, to recreate. And then um, the first sentence um, is active and reprogrammed so it can be an interactive sculpture. And, and someone uh, who's visiting the sculpture could literally type over our first sentence to try to construct a new message that goes into the computer and projects out live time. Um, even earlier that, I was inspired by landscapes, both of, of beauty, uh, but of awe. This like tsunami-like great wave um, in a Japanese print, um, and then reimagined in a sculptural form through uh, music. Uh, media. So thinking about the production of music, this is not a vinyl, but it even predates that to 77s, really fragile. I melted them to create that new wave um, and thinking about how quickly our music production changes. Uh, they sweep us up in this frenzy of and movement and then quickly goes away. Um, and then before there were the slideshow over PowerPoint and um, our digital interface was the 35 millimeter slides. So I had the fortune or the strangeness of being around when the Met decided that they had finished their digitization and moved on. So they were going to discard the, their um, 
slide archive. And so they selected some artists to give away this entire archive. And I just wanted to talk about what it would feel like to walk through their digital archive, um, but in real slide form where there'd be dupes and there would be degradation of images, but also their institutional memory and what it looks like to look and browse uh, through this history. Um, other shots of inspiration here is a Zen garden and uh, beautiful scholars rock. So my next project I'm showing you is at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. And so I wanted to recreate a space of contemplation, um, like a Zen garden, looking at uh, 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 rock specimen. And here I'm making it um, in my studio um, with assistants um, using um, uh, old technology and e-waste. Uh, so my scholars rocks are made out of mobile phones and it really archives our last 20 years of a digital interface through the mobile phone. Um, but it also is a space where we're constantly looking at um, and this black uh, uh, screen it has become the kind of narcissism reflecting back at us. And the scholars rocks are embedded not with sand, uh, raked sand as in a Japanese garden, but here through the coiling of uh, the leftover cables. Um, and then it also seems like a dystopic uh, landscape because as we are encouraged to upgrade all the time, um, we don't think about what happens um, to the hardware, you know, what happens to the phone that can no longer upgrade with the, that software. It ends up in our landscapes. So as we're extracting the copper and extracting all the minerals to make this technology, which is becoming harder and harder, um, we also don't know how to bring it back uh, and what's left behind or the toxicities that are coming from our technology. So this question of carbon footprint, even though we're all feeling all digital as if uh, we take up less space, it takes up more space somewhere else. Um, we're just not seeing it. Um, and so I end with this last image and would love to open up with questions. Um, and so I thank you for your patience um, and hope that inspired some interesting conversation. Thank you, Jean. And as we look at your work and we feel some energy from it, just to speak for myself, the energy and all of the accumulation of these objects that are discarded feels like a process in itself. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that process, how the accumulation phase happens. Sure. Yeah, the process is really important. Of course, um, the idea of infusing labor and having my, um, the, the hand be in the work, right? Um, but I really invite the creative process to be really an open collaboration with this uh, institutions and the communities I work with. Um, so this becomes the invitation, if not the catalyst for those who not, don't always have art or can make art, um, um, uh, sharing that process with so many people. And that could be the material exchange I have with my community, um, which is just an invite. What are you discarding? Um, this in, what seems insignificant now because, because of your use is gone has become the potential. Um, and it really speaks to their lived experience, right? And it's part of their life story. Uh, so that comes into the work. Uh, so there's a beautiful, like, human interaction with people, um, the, the museums or the procurement uh, point person ends up being the interface, which is so lovely to interact with people and their objects. Um, and then there's the transformation itself. And whenever I can work with students or young people is to kind of talk about how we can deconstruct a material um, that we might not think about in different forms than just trash, you know, uh, but then reimagine them as potential, you know, and if we can do that, I mean, we are in a circular economy and a regenerative space. So it has a lot of ecological impact um, ideas about, um, you know, the environment that we're in with climate crisis coming you know, so the process is incredibly important. It takes time. Um, it's not, again, instant, um, but the time is worth investing in because we're not extracting resources or just paying for material costs. Uh, it really is uh, being mindful about what 
is being left behind, what is being um, inconsidered that could still hold value or can become, uh, you know, the celebrated artwork, right? Um, but it is actually coming from our, uh, our discards. You know, like you said about uh, incorporating community, of all the ways we could incorporate community, this one is one that has low entry uh, risk, you know, gathering things. And it never occurred to me till hearing this, that, you know, a way to gather community is bringing people together in a way that could work at, at any level, any ability um, to get them. Yes. And, and yes. And it, it actually really transforms people when some, you know, when an artist says, so what are we doing? What's the big heroic art thing we're doing? So skilled, it's so, and I'm like, picking up trash <laughs> up wow. after our elves, beautifying a neighborhood. Um, yeah. It really, when people spend time doing it, you, they start looking like, why do we have so much trash? Yeah. Oh my God, I produce so much trash. I'm throwing this again and again and again. So it really starts to look carefully at our behavioral uh, conditions and what, it's, what impact it's having in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And you're picking up other people's trash, but then you kind of look at your own behavior. And, you know, so I've um, done these public projects um, where the program is, you know, an engagement with Jean Shin, but be careful showing up because you're picking up trash in your own neighborhood um, or it's coming downstream, right? And it's not even yours, but it moved to the next town. And so you're picking up someone else's trash and someone else will pick up your trash, right? Well, the ocean, who's picking up that? You know, so this is all the kind of we keep pushing the problem away to someone else further down downstream. Mm -hmm. But there's only some place it can go. <laughs> We're at I'm that getting, point. Yeah, yeah. Some questions in the chat. One uh, question is, what if any new thoughts do you have surrounding your work with the global pandemic experience we are all sharing? Yeah, ironically, that work pause um, from the Asia Art Museum happened and it was supposed to open in 2020. <laughs> so it literally opened in February, was open for three weeks and the pandemic shut us down. And here I was saying, you know, we're maybe too dependent on technology. It's robbing us of our connection with people in real time and real physical space. So I created these pods, you know, I wanted people to sit behind a Zen garden, you know, looking silently, being with each other in a real space and time. And <laughs> that only lasted. And we were, in fact, saved by technology, right? So that we can communicate. Uh, and it's like, wow, we already have our phones. We're hooked to looking at our phones and talking with people only through our phones. And now we do it over Zoom. <laughs> so we just added another component to it. So I, I, it's deeply ironic, if not um, appropriate. Um, so, the, so the conversation has gotten more uh, precarious, you know, uh, but also more threatening. I think we are now not taking for granted our ability to connect with each other in real time, real space, and that digital feels different. Um, although it has a life of its own, right? So there are all these interesting com complex relationships we build around technology um, because we want it, because we need it, but it also has changed us completely in the way we have become human or the way we exist. And now year two, right? We're still yeah. zo zoom zooming away. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm so curious what has happened to our physical environment and our mm. love and joy of the physical environment around us. And, and, and the piece you were care. talking about was the one built by the uh, different technology that we would then have looked at like a Zen garden, but now we're looking at each other's faces on Zoom. We have a question from Gwyneth Chow. Hi, Shin. Um, I had a question about your uh, process when you collaborate with others in the community. So you mentioned that one piece where you had, I think, school students build some of the structures. Just wondering what kind of um, instructions you leave them with or how do you start that conversation when you're working with maybe non-artists? 
Yeah, I mean, thankfully, I was working um, with the educator. So whereas the Cure 12 team was very limited, they had, you know, dozens of arts educators because the public school system literally didn't have art students, art teachers. So the museum was out doing servicing community through art. Um, so they're amazing because they've often translated uh, for all levels an art project, right? So we prototyped uh, a work and I said, well, let's, let's really de-skill because anyone can do anything right here. So let's not make this fabrication really complicated or toxic. Let's say scissors, let's say it's like, you know, thinking of Legos, people love to assemble, people love to cut people, you know, so we had little templates, you could draw your own leaf, or you can copy a leaf, or you can, you know, so there are different ways. So those who want to be creative can be more creative, those who like, tell me how to do this, then can follow a, a template. So it was for all ages, you know, and then those who felt like I can go beyond a scissor and not injure myself could get a glue gun. <laughs> and those who could go beyond the glue gun can, you know, so could start to assemble them. So it really was open to a lot of different levels um, and those who wanted to learn. Um, but I think the physical idea was so great when I was participating in one of the workshops. Um, afterwards, they said, I could do this at home. And I said, you're absolutely right. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go home and uh, look at my recycling bin. And I said, yep. And you can make your own forms, right? So we just wanted to have people like take away literally um, something that they felt like they owned um, and that they participated in a project that then they could do on their own, right? Uh, and be their own artists. But it takes a while for them to conceive of themselves as being a creative person or someone who can, or, you know, they say, oh, I don't have the right materials, I don't have the right supplies. You're like, uh-uh, you've got everything at home. <laughs> so it's really wonderful to be able to do that. So I tried to think, I mean, once I redid the project, I was using a whole another system because I was not doing it with school kids. Was, I really made the floating maze during a pandemic. So then I could hire assistants. We worked outside. So we were using heat guns and, you know, <laughs> other things that were a little more sophisticated, you know, um, and then the rigging system was much more complicated, which professionals did. So, you know, different uh, venues, um, the, it's a different um, kind of process, you know, um, mm. but to me, I don't value one over the other. It's just uh, what makes sense. And at that time, sharing the labor was a sharing the love, right? And it was really part of the project. Mm sharing the labor and also in the chat, there's a question about sort of a similar thing about connecting how, this question is, I'm curious about how you went about connecting with the new American citizens and asking for their discarded clothes or their clothes. Yeah, well, it, you know, sometimes the um, administrators are like, I don't know how to distribute or tell an immigrant who's just gonna, you know, they have too much paperwork. I don't wanna be like, hey, I have this public art paperwork, <laughs> you know, it, it's too complicated, you know? And so I said, well, let's uncomplicate it. What is the easiest? It's like, well, you should talk to them about the work. And I was like, well, how do I do that? Do I show up and do I take a teller? Do I show up? No, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, so I was like, well, what do I do? You know, and so then they said, well, actually, you know, we start the ceremony, they're all there. <laughs> And why don't you introduce your project and we'll give you five minutes and then we'll start the ceremony. So that was so beautiful. And I never thought I could have access, but sometimes when things don't work out, they offer you something that seems almost impossible, but it was so sacred. I was like, really? I get to go to their ceremony? I get to celebrate and witness this and invite them to be part of this permanent work. It, it was so magical. I was crying, you know, asking them, like, I know what it feels like. My family went through the same process, you know? Um, so yeah, that was kind of really beautiful for me to be there with, you know? And then not that I, everyone signed up, but if I got a handful and it was probably like, a, you know, a couple dozen people who said yes. And from that, a couple dozen uh, actually uh, followed up mailing me something, you know, but it was so meaningful. And I also feel like even if they didn't, and maybe it planted a, a thought in their mind or the girl who went with their dad said, hmm, I could be an artist, <laughs> you know? So you never know what kind of impact you have, you know, just by mm -hmm. being present and uh, talking about art to uh, people. Mm. 
Thank you. And one, there are two more from the chat and then we're gonna close up, but this is a, from uh, one of our participants. In the years immediately following 9-11, a lot of artists were preoccupied by um, practices that emphasized highly methodical systems of repetition and accumulation. Uh, do you see you, your own evolution as part of, uh, as an artist being shaped uh, in part by that? Well, right, 9-11 really did shape us all. I mean, I was here downtown Brooklyn, so the smoke just literally took over. And I was heading literally to downtown Manhattan to install a piece. And the piece was the stacking piece. So it was a different stacking piece, but I was literally putting Rolodex's cards together and then it got shut down downtown. So yes, I was already doing a lot of accumulation labor and stacking, but also stacking with that thought of like um, bringing people together and then to have the greatest structures fall apart. So talking about you could never imagine that happening and it did. And then I was thinking when I was stacking those cards, like we think that we're all superheroes and all of that, but we are incredibly vulnerable and uh, communities are incredibly vulnerable that I wasn't even thinking about ourselves, but really what it did to the world um, and, uh, and the effect of dismantling um, because we quote, I uh, needed to get rid and address terrorism. So I think we learned a lot. Um, but systems were crumbling and systems aren't as strong as we imagined. Um, and I was living literally through that process. A lot of my artist friends were like, I'm not making art. And I, for me, it was like, of course I don't have access, right? I need to put the show together, it got shut down. And then when I did have access, it was the best therapy, like just to go and rebuild these structures um, in my quiet space. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. This reflection, uh, bringing people together and bringing materials together. And the last question is what you are currently working on. Oh, thank you so much. I am so excited because I have two projects, um, one in Philadelphia, that's going to be opening, um, you know, early June-ish, uh, and it deals with freshwater mussels. So again, another species that really is under um, population uh, endangerment. Um, and uh, they've had a long history making pearl buttons at some point and uh, populating our rivers. Uh, and it's gonna be in Philadelphia at the Cherry Street uh, Piers. Uh, and then another project in Fort Worth. So um, the Carter Museum has asked me to do a public uh, commission as well. So excited for those projects and more. <laughs> Did you say that it would be with shells? Just, can you say that part again? Yes, it is really, um, we're looking at some dead shells that we can collect because they are dying, um, but we're hoping not to find so many. Um, and then also I would love to have a habitat of living and uh, caring for this fresh mussel shells, which are filtering the water. So we need them for a lot of um, uh, habitat uh, ecosystem um, regenerative water, fish, they, all the populations starts with the fresh um, mussels. There are films where the, the water is very cloudy and then the yes. mussels just clear the water. It's such an amazing experience to watch. And that's exactly what I wanna do with pumping up uh, our current water to having the mussels do their work and having it filter out with clear clarity, yeah. Thank you so very much. This process of listening to the different aspects of your work coming together and being here together with you tonight is just such an honor and pleasure for us. Um, please know we will, I'll keep this open for a little while, but we'll close this session. And please visit us at Vermont Studio Center in person uh, when we're here. And we look forward to hosting you, Jean Shin, at, when, in person and also for residents uh, who will be here visiting with us too. Thank you so very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. See you hopefully soon. Okay.